Yosef is meeting his brothers for the first time in many years. And rather than just revealing to them who he is so he can go home to his father, he plays an entire story on them. A whole drama. He tests them. He causes them a lot of grief. He causes the father to get extremely worried, to separate from Binyamin, not knowing if he is ever going to see him back. From our place of understanding, we would think that a kind person would let bygones be bygones. What is it going to help now? What's the point of dragging them through all of this? They are whatever they are. They made their mistakes. We're here now. There was a lot of suffering. Why don't we just move on? The reason we would think this way today is because we don't understand the intricacies of how reality works. We've forgotten the rules of how the universe interacts with the inhabitants. These rules are based on attributes, attributes that get created by forces, forces that are very powerful because they made everything be. So for example, the one who made human beings, he made a human being to operate through attributes. The attributes are driving the behavior. And so therefore, we know that this is the way he thinks. This is how he operates. He operates through attributes. How? Because this is how he created the, entri the entire system of how we interact with each other and of how nature interacts with us. These attributes have three basic settings, right, left, and center. The right, the attribute of kindness. The left, the attribute of judgment. The attribute of strength and courage. And the center is a mix of the two, is the balance that we're trying to achieve. These attributes are real in every human being. When you interact with a human being, you are going to be handled by the attributes, not by the person. The person is the same in all of us. You're not going to be handled by the person. You're going to get handling from the attributes. And based on how you interact with the attributes, you're going to get results. The results might be favorable or unfavorable, all according to the interactions between the attributes. Not personal at all. Nothing to do with you as, you as a person. Never anything to do with you as a person. You as a person is the same in all of us. We're all the person. We're all the one, the special one that is and should be seen and respected. And yet, it's not what we're going to get. What we're going to get is, how did my attributes respond to yours? And on a deeper level, when we experience life, when we experience our own thoughts, when we experience our own emotions, we're not experiencing the reality of a human being. We're, we're experiencing how are our attributes responding to the reality at the moment. How 
are our attributes responding to the events and the circumstances that are happening around us. And so, these attributes demand things of us in order for them to flow fluently through our system, in order for us to receive their intelligence and interact with each other intelligently, we have to learn how to listen to the intelligence of the attributes. The attributes know. This is how we can understand each other. This is how we can relate to each other. It's because we're interacting with attributes. We're asking our own attributes. Does this make sense? Is this reasonable? It's all based on information and the response of an attribute. And so, in the original existence, in the permanent existence, there's only kindness. There can be only kindness, because it's permanent, it's one, it's the only thing that is. But when we want to create the temporary, there has to be judgment. What are we going to create, and what are we not going to create? If it's temporary, it means it's not everything anymore, it's not the permanent. It's not the thing that never changes. So what is it? It's something that's less than that. That less means that there's been a judgment. We've been favoring something over something else. So the moment we're discriminating between realities, there is judgment. There is limitation. There is a requirement for strength for those who want to manifest, for those who want to be chosen as being rather than not being, because not everything is. That's the nature of the temporary. And so this attribute, which is inherent in our form of existence, It demands that everything that gets produced be judged. Is it based on the judgment that we originally desired that this should exist? Or does this thing not comply with the original judgment for existence? Does this thing go out of the limits of what we originally designated that we want should exist? This is the nature of judgment. And so, in that nature of judgment, everything needs to receive in response to its behaviors, in response to its creations, exactly according to how it creates. And this way, those who don't deserve to be will eliminate themselves. The concept of Mida Kenegad Mida means those who are kind, those who deserve to live, will receive life. And those who don't deserve to live based on their own judgment, then they say that they shouldn't be here because, based on their beliefs, they don't belong here. And therefore, they self eliminate. This is the nature of judgment. And so kindness says everyone should get. Judgment says no, not everyone should get. What we get should be based on merit. Merit that we are givers. If we're not givers, we shouldn't get. If we're giving to not givers, it means that the kindness is not really being kind. We're violating our own principles. That's what judgment says. And so, these attributes cannot be avoided. It's not up to individuals to decide if these attributes are going to apply 
The attributes create the individuals. The attributes are before the individuals. The attributes are divine attributes. They're running the world. They make all the decisions every single day in every single life. And so Yosef knows that if his brothers are not going to get along with the attribute of judgment, they're not going to have any way out. They're not going to have a way home. They're going to be in trouble that has no limit. And so rather than him doing the easy thing, which is simply to reveal himself and give them an easy time, he wants to correct the wrong because he knows that in reality there has been a wrong. This is not something we can ignore. It's not up to him to say that it never happened. It happened. It's real. Reality knows it's real. It's imprinted in every single experience of all those who are involved. And unless we somehow undo the damage, it remains with them. They're not free just because he lets them off the hook. They have to deal with something much greater than that. They have to come back to the truth. They have to come back to reality. And so he orchestrates an entire process where he's going to undo the damage and test to see if with Binyamin they behave differently than they did with him. All this in order to correct their face against the infinite face. So his kindness is a much deeper kindness. It's a much more real kindness. It's a much more eternal kindness. But then, while he's still allowing all this to play out, his own attributes became activated. While he was trying to give them this entire process of the Midas Adin, of what the Midas Adin would expect, his Midas Arachamim suddenly started going out of control. He couldn't do it any longer. And this, this awakening of the Midas Arachamim, when his Midas Arachamim woke up, then he knew that they have been forgiven. When can we find compassion in the human heart? Compassion comes after forgiveness. This is the nature of forgiveness, is that it switches the heart from judgment to compassion. Every time we're in, we're in need for forgiveness, the reason we're in need for forgiveness is because our heart has gone into judgment. Had we been in compassion, there wouldn't be no need for forgiveness. And so suddenly now, the rulership went over to a different attribute. And suddenly now the behavior went to a completely different avenue. Suddenly now, the same person that before felt that they still need to go through a process, he himself couldn't do the process any longer. The attributes were fighting with each other until compassion took over. Once compassion took over, now there's no longer any judgment. The only reason there was judgment was because the brothers had brought upon themselves judgment. They had entered the world of judgment when they judged Yosef. Yosef judged them. And then there was a cycle of judgment that caused tremendous damage, caused the roots of exile, the beginning of exile. As exile is something that we take upon ourselves. If we don't agree that we deserve exile, then we cannot be exiled. Something inside of us has to agree. And the only way we would agree 
is if we're in a state of judgment, if we've lost compassion, if we are looking at the world from a place that is not really real. It's a place that doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. It just has a little piece in the middle and that piece is filled with judgment. So many rules, but no real basis, no real understanding of anything about how reality works, how people work, how the spirit works, how the body works, and yet so many judgments. Judgment would imply perfect knowledge of the nature of reality. Only one who has perfect knowledge of the nature of reality is qualified to judge. And so for us, the layers that separate the one experiencing from the one that is, the layers that separate the awareness from coming back to presence, are layers of judgment that can be melted by compassion. All these layers include a statement that says that this reality is unacceptable on some level. Whether it's a person, a situation, a circumstance, a thought, a feeling, a sensation, whatever it is we're judging, we're saying this reality and I cannot coexist in peace. That's the essence of all the veils, of all the times we closed our heart and wanted to experience life less rather than more. And that causes the temporary reality to become very dense, very low vibration, very needy. And, and that type of reality, there can be no presence. Presence is not available. Because the past is still extremely active, still very present, still trying to solve problems that don't exist for decades. And so, the way to melt through all these layers is by realizing the true nature of things, the permanent reality, the reality upon which we built this structure that doesn't really exist. The interpretations, the beliefs, the different dresses that we covered life with that are not accurate, that are misguiding our decisions, misguiding our thought process, misguiding our emotional response to what's taking place. So the, the goal for us, the reason we were given the title is so that we have the capacity to convert judgment to compassion. The title is a manual, is a recipe to converting judgment to compassion. The name that we're looking for, we're calling the Creator by a specific name. The name that we're calling Him by is the name of compassion, the name of mercy. That's the one we want should show up. When that one shows up, it doesn't matter anymore what happened. That's the only one we can really get along with. If it's going to be about what happened, then what are we going to start calculating now, every single thing that happened and how it happened and what we thought and what was our intention? That's an endless process. And who is going to be clean? So the only one we can get along with is the compassionate one that doesn't really care who did what? It cares more about how did this entire mess happen in the first place? 
What was the intention of creation? How did we lose sight of what was supposed to happen here? Because as soon as there's compassion, then we see the truth becomes revealed. The truth is a compassionate truth. The truth of judgment is to point out the practical side of things. And the truth of compassion is to point out the essence, the essence of things. The essence is always pointing towards compassion. If we look at any individual life and we understand the basis of their suffering and their mistakes and the different struggles they had to go through until they became what they are, then we would always find compassion. And yet, when we simply look at the actions, then the first thing that comes to mind is judgment. It's impossible for us to imagine what a human being looks like when everything inside of them is compassion. The world hasn't seen people like that in a very long time because we come into a world and it's covered in judgment, it's covered in struggle, it's covered in competition. But from what we know from those who knew what we know from the prophets is that everything is different. The body, the mind, the behaviors, the communities, the entire life experience is entirely different. It cannot be compared. The only way really to describe the difference between an experience that's based on compassion versus a, an experience that's created by judgment is to say that the experience created by compassion would be described as heaven and the experience created by judgment would be described as hell. And that's actually the reality of what these two things are. Because one who goes against the world and never looks back doesn't really know that there is compassion. Doesn't know to look for it, not while he's in the body and not after. And so their experience, if that's how they choose to behave, is one of judgment. The attribute that they chose is what will guide them to their future. And so one who lives by judgment has to be perfect in some way, perfect in the eyes of the one who sees all. Or else, the attribute of judgment becomes too hot to handle. And yet on some level, we all have to interact with all attributes. We all have to make sense in all their eyes in order for us to exist, in order for us to survive. Whatever attribute we're not getting along with, we're lacking certain functions in our practical lives. We're lacking certain functions in our spiritual lives. We're lacking certain functions in our emotional lives. And so we see how the Shvatim, the, the people in that time, they saw life for something that was intelligent, was alive, was real. Things made sense in that, in that world, even though to us it seems like the behaviors are not suitable to the way that we would think. But the reason they're not suitable to the way that we would think is because we don't understand the details of what's really happening over here. We don't understand 
the information they base their decisions on. And yet, we know from the little bit that we can see and understand that these people lived every single word, every single thought was with purpose, was alive, was involved. They, were, they didn't live in distraction. They weren't the distractions that we have today, but these people specifically, more than all the others, wouldn't get distracted. Life was extremely real. Everything was with their entire spirit. Everything was thought through to the last detail. This is the nature, this is the capacity of these people. This is why they were so meaningful and influential to the future of humanity. And each one is an expression of the divine attributes, the divine features, the divine zodiac, the 12 signs against the 12 tribes, each one representing a specific personality within the nature of the cosmos, within the nature of the big man that we are all a part of. Each one of us represents different portions, different personalities, different aspects of the big man, the man of potential, of all men. The basic design with which all of us are creating. And so each one, as he goes through the world, as he lives on the physical reality, he he is expressing, he is defining the attributes that he represents. The permanent is interacting within the temporary. The permanent is becoming the temporary. And all these are, govern are governed by these same attributes, the attributes that are creating, are creating themselves in the manifested reality. The kindness of the Creator creates a man that's a vessel for that kindness, called Avram. The, ve the intelligence, the attribute, that is the kindness of the Creator, the Divine Kindness, creates within the manifested reality of Ram, who is a vessel for that kindness, a manifestation for that kindness. Now everything that Avram does is defining the force that he represents. Yitzhak represents judgment. Everything Yitzhak does is defining what the attribute is going to do. This is why it is so meaningful, it's so significant, if Yitzchak is going to give blessings to Yaakov, or Yitzchak is going to give blessings to Esau, because he is now defining the permanent truth, how it's going to interact with the temporary truth. He's now defining for the duration of the existence of our species, how the attributes are going to interact with each other, and as a result, what's going to be our experience. Because our experience is being decided by the attributes. Even now, every word is being formed, is being chosen by the attributes that are trying to express themselves. That's the nature of the intelligence that creates the words and the sentences that we create. And so everything has inherently within it the truth that's creating it. 
if we reverse engineer the sentences that are being said, we can find the attributes hidden, hidden inside the sentences. They're alive inside the sentences. And this is created biologically. This is created on a physical level. There is movement that neuroscience can perceive with the tools that we have today. We can see the mind think and create, and that becomes concept that gets dressed in words. And that concept is expressing attributes. And those attributes are making all the decisions, not only what we're going to say, also what we're going to do, also how we're going to feel. And so it's the attributes, the permanent ones, creating for themselves a dwelling within the temporary. And we're the partners. We're parts and pieces of those attributes. Each one of us <coughs> perceiving based on their vessel. A vessel that was created also by the attributes through the zodiac signs the planets that surround the solar system, all of them creating a vessel for the attributes that are expressing themselves through these different energies. And so the goal of us as a nation, the reason that we were created as a nation, is to bring compassion to humanity. Humanity has been plagued by judgment for 6,000 years, a divine decree. It's part of our evolution. We had to learn and discover and become certain energies. And yet, through the power of speech, we could have interpreted this process, this period, in many different directions, but given that we had an overage of judgment because of the lessons that we're learning, our speech only took us deeper into judgment. And so, in order to move on, to move out of this difficult phase, we need to use our speech in order to bring compassion into the situation, in order to bring the waters of compassion and to reduce the flames of judgment. The flames of judgment are visible in any type of suffering. Any type of suffering includes a psychological component and the psychological component is always a form of judgment. The world is coming to a place that it needs relief more than ever. And relief comes in the form of compassion. Compassion opens potentials within the physical biology, within the spiritual biology, within our capacity for thought and emotion that are simply not available when we're in a state of judgment. This is why, as the world was going deeper and deeper into judgment, all the miracles disappeared, all revelations disappeared, all kind interactions between the permanent and the temporary ceased because of the judgment that was happening within the temporary. And so, to bring back the appropriate relationship with the permanent, we have to synchronize our vibrations with the permanent. The permanent vibrations are of unconditional kindness. Only through unconditional kindness can we support all these different attributes. Attributes that seem to contradict each other and yet they are really one and the same. 
one and the same as is coming out from his permanence and allowing the temporary to express the different qualities of the permanent. So from this story, which is the drawing of whoever drew space, whoever created time, creating in the world of consciousness, creating these souls to come in specifically in this sequence, to create the 12 tribes that correlate to the forces that create life. This was in order to demonstrate the relationship between the permanent and the temporary, to demonstrate the involvement of the permanent within the temporary. And so it's through the behaviors, through the interactions, through the relationships of these people that we learn about these attributes, that we discover the meaning of our own journey, that we can connect to something that is more real than anything that's available in today's cultures. So may we all have the merit and the courage to allow compassion to direct us, to allow the attribute of compassion, which is the purpose of our mission on this planet, to really guide our behaviors, to guide our thinking, to guide our emotions, to bring forgiveness to all the judgments of the past, to bring forgiveness to all the different struggles where we felt like we didn't have enough, or we didn't do enough, or we didn't know enough. Compassion that's deep enough, that's real enough to override all the different obstacles that we might have behind us so that we can get to a place of reconciliation, so that we can return to ourselves, so that we can appease the one that dwells within all, the one that is the source of the attributes, the one that gave each one of us a little piece of himself when he gave us existence. So may we all find the compassion to return to that one, to see that one in each other, and to unite as that one. May that be soon. <laughs>